Welcome to Single Malt History with Gareth Russell, pouring out your serving of pure, distilled, intoxicating, and occasionally delicious history. A warning, this episode contains discussions of suicide, which some listeners may find distressing. Hello, um, beginning I would say with a mea culpa, which is that as some of you who maybe listened to our uh, season three premiere episode last week might remember, or were too polite to point out, some of you, um, so including some friends, politely messaged and said, did you forget this? I mentioned a giveaway in um, the first episode and then just forgot to provide any details. I am going to put that down to COVID brain fog, um, which seems to be lifting. I don't think I can blame um, mental lethargy on it anymore, but I just completely forgot it. Uh, Because this week is the anniversary of what we're about to talk about, I will do the giveaway next week. And all the epi- uh, all the details will be in the next episode. I am very sorry. I don't know how I just completely forgot about it, but um, yeah, I'm going to blame COVID. It's it's. I think that's a fair exchange. So my apologies. And moving on to today's episode, recalling the events of the 28th of June, 1914, when a pistol fired what was later called the shot that was heard around the world. Few things in modern history are paradoxically as famous and as least as the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo on a warm summer's afternoon. So the fame arises from the fact that the murder of the heir to the Austrian throne set off a chain reaction that led a few weeks later to the start of the First World War. So in that sense, the assassination that took place 108 years ago today to the day of broadcast was uh, one of, uh, sorry, has become one of the most frequently cited events in world history. Its dire consequences are still taught in nearly every British high school history curriculum as the point at which the flame was put to the kindling and set fire first to Europe and then to much of the globe. Yet the importance of the Archduke's death is such that it has in many ways obscured what actually happened that day, what led up to it, and the personalities of its victims and perpetrators. Their story does not begin and end with a gunshot, although, and it may be slightly early to begin contradicting myself, I suppose, in a way, it did. Because a quarter of a century before bullets claimed one future Austrian emperor, they took another. The circumstances were different, even if the rank of the victims was not On a freezing night at the end of January 1889, 30-year-old Crown Prince Rudolf shot himself at his hunting lodge in northeastern Austria. The suicide of the Austrian Emperor's only son sent shockwaves through Europe. It was widely covered and wildly speculated about in the press. It was not long before it emerged that the Crown Prince's body had been discovered lying next to that of his mistress, Baroness Maria Vetsera. Although the Baroness's letters, which were not taken from a security deposit box until 2015, prove unambiguously that both she and the Crown Prince had been contemplating a joint suicide pact for some time, and Rudolf had dealt with periods of intense depression in the years preceding the act, Their deaths stunned and devastated many of their relatives. Even though there had been, as I say, warning signs that all was not well with Rudolf, the news itself was an absolutely um, heartbreaking shock. The hunting lodge where they died was converted into a convent. It still is actually a functioning convent and every day um, prayers are still offered for Rudolf and Maria's souls. 
Rudolf's suicide left his estranged Belgian wife, the Crown Princess Stephanie, a widow to raise their five-year-old daughter, the Archduchess Elizabeth Marie. Their lives are very interesting. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to talk about them in a later episode, especially Elizabeth Marie becoming the Red Archduchess by joining a socialist party. What is relevant to us today is that Rudolf's death without a son saw his position as heir to the throne pass unexpectedly to his uncle, the Archduke Karl Ludwig. The second in line was now Karl Ludwig's eldest son, Franz Ferdinand, who had celebrated his 25th birthday only a few weeks before his cousin's suicide. Given that Rudolf was married and had already fathered a child, and was expected uh, to father more, neither Karl Ludwig nor Franz Ferdinand had ever realistically expected to see the Habsburg crown fall on their branch of the family. Franz Ferdinand was already one of the wealthiest private individuals in Europe, separate to his position in the Austrian imperial family. Aged 11, he had inherited the fortune and fabulous art collection of his childless Italian cousin, Duke Francesco V of Modena. A life of great private privilege and public duty pursuing his interest in the Imperial Navy was transformed by Rudolf's death. Seven years later, in 1896, Karl Ludwig fell ill shortly after returning from a holiday to Egypt and a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. He died likely from typhoid, and Franz Ferdinand thus became immediate, unambiguous heir to his uncle, the Emperor Franz Josef. The princeling, who would become one of history's most famous murder victims, was and has remained a mystery. Even people who knew Franz Ferdinand quite well often find it hard to predict what he would do or guess what he was thinking. Archduchess Zita, his niece by marriage, described him as a very powerful and determined personality, but also a devoted family man. Zita confessed that on several occasions, despite her personal fondness for Franz Ferdinand, she found him almost impossible to read and quite intimidating. His Imperial and Royal Highness, Archduke and Prince, Franz Ferdinand Karl Ludwig Josef Maria of Austria, Prince of Hungary, Prince of Bohemia, Prince of Croatia, or His Imperial Highness the Archduke of Austria Este, if you're in a rush, was born in his parents' palace in the Austrian city of Graz in the winter of 1863. At that time, his uncle, Emperor Franz Josef, had been on the throne for 15 years. Franz Ferdinand's Italian mother, perhaps it might be better to call her his Neapolitan mother, Maria Annunziata, was a younger sister of the last king of the independent Naples. Her family had lost power and been driven into exile when their monarchy was replaced during Italy's wars of unification. It had been only two years since Maria Annunziata's brother had fled their homeland and set up a government in exile as a refugee guest of the Pope. Although Austria, like France and the Vatican, still recognised the right of Maria Annunziata's family to be the rightful hereditary rulers of the Naples, Sardinia and Sicily, it was clear to nearly every pragmatic observer that the House of Bourbon would never return to power in the southern Italian peninsula. Little Franz Ferdinand would never have cousin kings ruling from the splendid Caserta Palace. Those days were over. Still, he did not want for influential relatives, certainly not on his father's side. His uncle ruled over most of Central Eastern Europe, head of the House of Habsburg, whose power stretched back even then half a millennium. It was a happy childhood for Franz Ferdinand, with Maria Annunziata encouraging a love of the arts, particularly music, in her children. She was a devoted mother, but she could not play with her children as much as she would have liked due to her declining health. When Franz Ferdinand was only seven, Maria Annunziata lost her battle with tuberculosis. Franz Ferdinand grieved her loss with his father and his three siblings, Otto, Ferdinand and Margareta. Two years later, their father married again. Their stepmother was Princess Maria Teresa of Portugal, 
Glamorous and charismatic, Maria Theresa proved an excellent stepmother to the four children. And she was tactful as they adjusted to her presence in place of their departed mother. In 1876, when she gave birth to the first of her two daughters, she had her baptised Maria Annunciata in honour of her stepchildren's mother. Franz Ferdinand adored his stepmother. And so despite the early bereavement, he would look back on his childhood as one largely of love and happiness. His education, conducted at home by hired tutors, governors and governesses, was heavy on religion and languages. Like many members of the family, Franz Ferdinand developed into a devout Roman Catholic. He loved his siblings, uh, even though he sometimes felt outshone by his brother Otto, with whom he probably had the shakiest relationship. Nicknamed Handsome Otto, he grew up into a notorious playboy, a bed-hopping good time who apparently liked to knock on his lover's doors wearing nothing but a general's hat and a smile. Otto was clearly their father's favourite son and their uncle's favourite nephew, which augmented Franz Ferdinand's feelings of inadequacy and even resentment. Despite his promiscuity, aged 21, Otto beat Franz Ferdinand up and down the aisle by marrying the King of Saxony's daughter, Princess Maria Josefa. Their first child, a son, arrived a year later. Then, Franz Ferdinand's sister, Margareta, married a German royal duke. Franz Ferdinand felt this keenly because he desperately wanted to be married. He wanted to be a husband and a father. As a teenager, his favourite books were romance novels. But he dragged his feet because unlike Otto and Margareta, he couldn't seem to find anyone of the right rank whom he also loved. As an officer, he had a few flings, but the pressure from himself and his family to marry mounted exponentially following cousin Rudolf's death. As the next emperor, duty required Franz Ferdinand pick a suitable woman as his future consort and Austria's future empress. With Rudolf's passing, Franz Ferdinand immediately became one of the most eligible bachelors in Europe. Gossip had it at one point that he might marry one of Queen Victoria's granddaughters by her son, the Prince of Wales, the princesses Louise, Victoria or Maud. Then, in 1899, there was a rumour in the press that Franz Ferdinand might be about to propose to the Tsar's cousin, Grand Duchess Elena of Russia. Both these rumoured British and Russian matches were problematic, even discounting Franz Ferdinand's interest, sorry, disinterest in them, because there was the religious issue. The Wales sisters were Protestants, the Grand Duchess Elena was Russian Orthodox. To marry Franz Ferdinand, they would have to convert to Catholicism, the faith of nearly all the Habsburg princesses since time immemorial, and none of them were in a rush to do that. Public opinion in both Britain and Russia was often laced with vigorous anti-Catholicism at the time, as vigorous, in fact, as the struggle of my left contact lens to leap right out of my eye while I'm trying to do this. No such problems were posed by the resilient or, uh, this is incredibly annoying, no, I am not a quitter, one take Russell, no such problems were posed by the resilient or, as Franz Ferdinand might have put it, tenaciously annoying Count and Countess of Paris. The Count of Paris was head of the deposed French royal family, and he had already snagged one crown for a daughter when his eldest Amelia married the future King of Portugal. Determined to bag a second diadem for one of her three unmarried sisters, the Count and Countess arranged excruciatingly obvious run-ins with their daughters in the hope of sparking an attraction from Franz Ferdinand. One by one, the Paris princesses dropped out of the running as Franz Ferdinand dragged his feet. Hélène married an Italian prince in 1895 and her sister Isabel married the Duke of Guise in 1899. 
Of the three British princesses Franz Ferdinand had been linked to, two had done likewise. Louise had married the Scottish Duke of Argyll, and her sister Princess Maud had married the man who would one day be King of Norway. Every time one of his rumoured potential brides married somebody else, it reinforced just how long it was taking Franz Ferdinand to marry by contemporary royal standards. By the time the Romanov marriage rumour was put to rest, it had been 10 years since Rudolf's suicide, and a decade of when will he pop the question and to whom. It got to the stage where Franz Ferdinand despaired of going to parties because he didn't know which unattached blue blood would be flung at him in the never-ending matrimonial merry-go-round of imperial matchmaking. To his credit, he would not be pressured, nor would he be rushed. Did he want to end up like late cousin Rudolf, miserable and inflicting that misery on his poor wife Stephanie? Or like his uncle and aunt, in a marriage where the husband was far more in love with the wife than she ever was with him? Or what about his own brother, handsome Otto, who had done the quote-unquote right thing by marrying in early adulthood to a good Christian royal, produced two sons, and then spent years jumping into the bed of anybody but his wife's? The reason for this delay was that The Archduke Franz Ferdinand didn't just want to marry. He wanted to be happy. The goal was a marriage rather than a wedding. He did not want someone much younger than him. He was emphatic. He wanted somebody clever. Looks, he said, were a secondary condition. The right ancestry for him was not a priority. Still, the matchmakers would not stop one of the most persistent of whom was the Duchess of Teschen, who I think of if she had never existed and a sort of scheming socialite constantly trying to foist her daughters into good marriages was a character in a novel and they called her the Duchess of Teschen. I would say it was too obviously, um, I mean, the name just sounds perfect for that kind of figure, but she did exist. Archduchess Isabella, Nee von Croy, Duchess of Teschen, a woman capable of Everest-like snobbery. She was the Queen of Spain's sister-in-law and a leading figure in Viennese high society. The Duchess of Teschen had the biblical sounding, or maybe musical, Broadway musical sounding tally, one or t'other. Let's go biblical sounding tally of seven unmarried daughters, ranging from the 19-year-old Archduchess Maria Christina to her youngest sister, the Archduchess Maria Alice. Isabella's hopes, naturally at this stage, fixated on the eldest of the girls, specifically the eldest, and she was determined to see Maria Christina become Austria's next empress and Hungary's next queen. Invitations by the Sackful arrived, bringing Franz Ferdinand to the Duchess's dinners, suppers, balls, sledging parties, a never-ending round of socialising, designed to bring Franz Ferdinand into Maria Christina's company, where hopefully love would sparkle like the Duchess's dinnerware. And it worked, after a fashion, for it was at one of these parties that Franz Ferdinand found his wife, not with the Duchess's daughter, but with her lady-in-waiting. Her name was Countess Sophie Chutek. Her father was an aristocratic diplomat from Bohemia, today uh, the Czech Republic. And it was at a masquerade ball at the Larish Palace in the spring of 1894 that Franz Ferdinand finally plucked up the courage to ask Sophie Chotek to dance. He called it the most wonderful evening of his life. By summer, he was in love. When she discovered what was going on, the Duchess of Teschen was livid. She fired Sophie only after mocking her in front of the entire household who had been assembled for the occasion. In her fury, the Duchess of Teschen sought an audience with the Emperor, who promised to speak to his nephew about this romance. I doubt Franz Josef fully shared the Duchess's priority that Franz Ferdinand's liaison with Sophie had brought shame on her household, but he promised to speak to the Archduke nonetheless.
Franz Josef has a reputation as a fusty conservative, a dry-souled pedant, but in some ways he was far more tolerant than his rather gruff, dour reputation suggests, particularly by 19th century standards. His youngest brother, the Archduke Ludwig Victor, had been gay and occasionally liked to dress in women's clothes. Franz Josef only stepped in to interfere in his brother's private life when Ludwig Victor was um, uh, slapped and punched at a gay bathhouse after which the in Vienna, after which the emperor suggested it might be a better idea if he spent more time out of the capital and at his palace in Salzburg until the scandal died down. But he also had a very good relationship with, as we have seen, his um, womanising nephew Otto. And so actually in his private life, the emperor could be more tolerant of um, romantic foibles in his relatives. There were, however, limits to that tolerance and that understanding. And when it came to the dignity of the dynasty, Franz Josef was implacable. This is partly speculative, but in part, I would argue, this was because of the circumstances in which he himself had become emperor in the first place. It had been a very difficult accession. The entire empire had been convulsed by rebellions against his uncle, Emperor Ferdinand I. The conservative establishment that had been in power for a generation, headed by Chancellor von Metternich, had to resign. The emperor abdicated, and to appease the rioters, the clean sweep in the elite continued, with Franz Josef's own father abdicating before he even became emperor, so that the fresh face of tomorrow young Franz Josef, could be hurled onto the throne to win back public approval, re-stabilise the dynasty and the empire. He was 18 years old, and from that day on, he had suppressed everything in himself in order to preserve the mission placed on his shoulders on the day his uncle abdicated. Franz Josef expected his nephew to do the same as he had once done for his own uncle, privately sacrifice in order to publicly serve. During their conversation, Franz Josef was thus absolutely horrified and furious to hear Franz Ferdinand tell him that he had no intention of ending his romance with Sophie Chotek. In fact, he wanted to marry her. The emperor was doubly confused. Firstly, the Duchess of Teschen had told him that Sophie was Franz Ferdinand's mistress, a falsehood which she proceeded to impart to everybody who was anybody in Austrian high society. It had never entered the Emperor's head that Franz Ferdinand planned to marry his mistress. How could he expect such a woman to one day become Empress? Franz Ferdinand insisted that he and Sophie had not slept together and that the Duchess of Teschen's claims were a tissue of spiteful lies, and the Emperor eventually believed his nephew that the relationship was not consummated. But even then, he pleaded, Franz Ferdinand couldn't seriously want to make Sophie his wife. Whatever her moral integrity, there was still disparity in rank. Franz Ferdinand doubled down. Why couldn't he marry Sophie Chotek, he argued. She was dignified, elegant. She was a devout Roman Catholic. The emperor himself described the countess as descending, it is true, from noble lineage. Her family, the House of Chotek, had been ennobled as aristocrats by the Habsburgs in the 16th century. They had a long history of loyal service to the Habsburg dynasty, and by Sophie's lifetime, the Choteks were one of the elite few amongst the imperial nobility who could boast 16 quarterings on their crest, which means at least four unbroken generations of aristocratic descent on all sides of her great-great-grandparents' families. All well and good, that wasn't the point. As the emperor pointed out, Franz Ferdinand's marriage to Sophie would nonetheless violate the Habsburg family statutes, which mandated that members of the dynasty only marry their social equals. 
those who didn't could stay in the family, but not in the line of succession. The emperor's great-uncle Johann had done precisely that, but he hadn't been first in line to the throne. At this point, poor Sophie herself tried to end things. It was all becoming too much. Franz Ferdinand suffered a near-total nervous breakdown and threatened suicide. Faced with the prospect of a second heir to the throne committing suicide, Franz Josef gave his permission. The couple could get married. With a catch. Several catches, in fact. Their marriage would be morganatic, by which Sophie would legally and religiously be Franz Ferdinand's wife, but she would be ineligible to share his royal titles, nor would any children they had together in the future be permitted to hold uh, titles, royal titles, I should say. They were given um, aristocratic titles in the end, but they were not allowed to hold royal titles, nor could those children ever stand in line to inherit the throne. Instead, the crown would eventually pass from Franz Josef to Franz Ferdinand to Franz Ferdinand's popular younger brother Otto, and from him to his eldest son Karl. If the Archduke wanted the Emperor's permission to marry and stay heir to the throne, he would have to swear on all that was holy to accept these conditions. So on the 20th of June 1900, 122 years ago today, to the date of broadcast, he swore the oaths. In a ceremony that took place at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, it was presided over by the Archbishop of Vienna and the Primate of Hungary. In their presence, Franz Ferdinand swore on the Bible that neither our wife nor the children which with God's blessing may come from this marriage nor any of their descendants can lay claim to those rights, honours, titles, coats of arms or privileges that would be accorded to wives of equal rank with their archducal husbands and the children of such an archducal union of equality in accord with the family statutes. Franz Ferdinand and Sophie married, and they had a wonderful honeymoon. But did Franz Ferdinand really think the etiquette-obsessed society surrounding his uncle would ever forgive Sophie for what they saw as her social climbing? His uncle's court wielded decorum like a rapier to humiliate and wound Sophie at every available opportunity. At Habsburg family dinners or lunches, if she was invited at all, she was served last and seated at the bottom of the table. She was forbidden from accompanying her husband to any state or official functions. She was forbidden from standing next to him if the national anthem was playing. The emperor made it clear that he did not think it was appropriate for the couple to sit in the same box when they went to the theatre, opera or ballet. At balls, those glittering parties which Imperial Vienna was so famous for, Sophie had to enter after every other female member of the imperial family in attendance. Both doors at the ballroom's entrance were flung open for the archduchess's entrances, One of those doors was theatrically closed just before Sophie stepped into the ballroom to further highlight her inferiority. On only one occasion did Sophie's preternatural dignity crack. When she realised that the court's Lord High Chamberlain, Prince Alfred de Montenovo, had purposefully failed to arrange for a gentleman to be at the door, to give Sophie his arm by way of an escort into the room as manners required. Bear in mind, Franz Ferdinand wasn't allowed to escort her in himself to these kind of parties. Refusing to suffer the mortification of entering a packed ballroom alone like a courtesan, Sophie chose to go home instead. Franz Ferdinand had an eidetic memory for insults, and he catalogued every single one inflicted by his uncle's courtiers upon his beloved wife. The relationship between the emperor's establishment and the heir to the thrones was already strained by political differences before it was nearly broken by personal matters. Perhaps understandably, the emperor could never quite bring himself to give his son Rudolf's old title of crown prince to the new heir. Franz Ferdinand never complained, but... 
The uncle's unease with his nephew intensified as the years passed. Most of the emperor's advisors regarded Franz Ferdinand as a dangerous liberal. Now, this might surprise people who know or have heard a little bit about this particular period in Austrian history. And that's because sections of the European press, and their version of him seems to have stuck, presented the Archduke as a foaming-at-the-mouth reactionary, when in fact, the fear in Vienna, and especially in Budapest, was that Franz Ferdinand harboured radical political views that would irrevocably change the structure and nature of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this seems as good a point as any to segue into a discussion on the crowns Franz Ferdinand was preparing to inherit. The Habsburgs had been on the throne, which one they'd had so many, for centuries. They are routinely described as an Austrian royal line, which is probably how they saw themselves in the later centuries of their rule. They had, however, originated in the forests and mountains of 12th century Switzerland. For a few centuries, a branch of the family had ruled the Spanish Empire, until their notorious policy of only marrying each other finally bred the family into the grave in 1700. The less, let's say, insular and hardier, heartier side of the family in Austria continued to flourish long after their notorious Spanish relatives had been consigned to the dustbin and trivia cavalcade of history. By the mid-1800s, the Habsburg Empire consisted of what's now Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, Slovenia, the Czech Republic, as well as parts of Poland and Romania. In 1908, they had solidified an existing reality by formally annexing the provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, although they had de facto been part of the empire long before that, and of which more later. For most of the 19th century, these dominions were known as the Austrian Empire and ruled from Vienna as its capital city. This did not sit well, to put it mildly, with Hungary, especially after the rise of Hungarian nationalism in the 19th century, which argued that Hungary was an independent kingdom with as much historical right to autonomy and monarchy as Austria. A would-be nationalist revolution in Hungary was defeated with great difficulty in 1848, yet it was a stopgap measure. The tension, the revolution was defeated, the causes were not. In 1867, bowing to sustained public pressure and perhaps the crucial support of his Bavarian wife, Empress Elizabeth, who loved Hungary far more than she ever did Austria, Franz Josef had signed one of the most momentous constitutional documents of the 19th century. Known as the Ausgleich, it created something called the Dual, D-U-A-L, monarchy. The Dual monarchy, where henceforth there would be two crowns, two thrones, two coronations, two capital cities, two parliaments, two cabinets, two governments, one empire. The empire was renamed the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Franz Josef and Elizabeth went to Budapest to be crowned king and queen of Hungary. The empire had two capital cities, Vienna serving Austria and all the other provinces, and Budapest serving Hungary. They would coordinate, where possible, on things like foreign policy, but from now on it was a two-system empire. Having won this great concession, Hungarian nationalists were determined to preserve it, at almost any cost. And they were their version of defending it was to make sure it was not extended to other parts of the empire. The Budapest government's treatment of non-Hungarians in its dominions alienated many in the empire's Slavic community. The Ausgleich had kicked the hornet's nest of local nationalisms in the rest of the empire. Why did Hungary get special treatment over, say, Croatia or Bohemia? or Slovakia, or Slovenia, or Bosnia, or Herzegovina. The Hungarian lobby argued quite openly that they were different because their national antecedents were superior. The Habsburgs had long ago inherited a completely separate, independent, ancient Hungarian monarchy. That criteria did not apply to the rest of the empire. It might, I mean, that sort of gives you a window into 19th century nationalisms. It was... Um, 
Obviously a movement that was increasingly defining itself by and in opposition to others, but it was very common for nationalists to say quite openly, our particular history makes us better than our neighbours. Austrian conservatives, having initially been hesitant about the Ausgleich, were more inclined to side with Hungarian nationalists after it in order to keep the system created in 1867 functioning. The other provinces were entitled to send delegates to the parliament in Vienna. Why did they need their own? Did they all think that they would have local matters decided in local assemblies? Yep, that was exactly what many liberals in the Austro-Hungarian Empire thought should happen, and Franz Ferdinand agreed with them. From the perspective of conservatives and Hungarian nationalists, it looked as if the dual monarchy wouldn't long outlast Franz Josef's eventual funeral. As a young man before his marriage, Franz Ferdinand travelled widely, and one visit in particular greatly impacted his political views, which was his trip to America in 1893. He returned from the Great Republic, both unsettled and inspired. He was appalled by how money-oriented America was and how indifferent its culture seemed to be to the suffering of workers and immigrants, especially in its big cities. However, the federal structure of the American Republic had inspired the Archduke. Why couldn't Hungary function like, say, Virginia? Croatia like... Oregon, Bosnia like Connecticut, Herzegovina like Mississippi. And as I've said that, I'm now beginning to wonder, was Oregon a state at the time I am making this comparison? Because I just lifted. Well, we'll find out. Well, through seamless editing, editing, you mightn't be able to tell that I'm no longer one take Russell, but I can confirm that Oregon was a state um, as of the 1893 visit. It was admitted to the Union on Valentine's Day 1859, so my point stands. Just had a slight nightmare vision of making a very dim-witted point. So to take it again, why couldn't Hungary function like, say, Virginia, Croatia like the state of Oregon, Bosnia like Connecticut or Herzegovina like Mississippi. Each part of the empire could have its own version of a state legislature with Vienna fulfilling the comparable role of Washington DC. All pan-imperial matters could be decided there, like foreign policy and certain federal policies. Everything else could be left to the states and provinces. Franz Ferdinand concluded that only by implementing a similar system in Austria-Hungary could the empire's many tensions and the mess of the Ausgleich be resolved. A federalised monarchy would give all the empire's communities an opportunity to deal with local matters to their own satisfaction, while simultaneously solidifying the throne's position as the force that brought unity and stability. When rumours about what he planned to implement after becoming emperor started circulating, his critics claimed this proved Franz Ferdinand was anti-Hungarian. Because of his support for the modernisation of the army and the Imperial Navy, he was characterised by his opponents as a warmonger. In fact, Franz Ferdinand thought a strong Austrian military would help prevent future huge wars, and his opposition to war, or unnecessary wars he sought, was so strong that it caused a permanent rupture in his friendship with Count Konrad von Hutzendorf, the Austrian military's chief of staff. In particular, the two men fell out over Count von Hutzendorf's constant lobbying for an Austrian war against Serbia. Franz Ferdinand's growing alienation from Austrian conservatives accelerated the coldness Franz Ferdinand felt from his conservative uncle, the emperor. Fortunately, Franz Ferdinand's private life proved far happier. Although he and Sophie had full use of the magnificent Belvedere Palace in Vienna as their residence, they rarely used it. Vienna was not the friendliest place in the world for them, as we've heard. Instead, they spent most of their year travelling with their three children, Sophie, Maximilian and Ernst, born between 1901 and 1904. Vienna was for New Year's, which the family ducked out on as early as was politely possible, to go to the alpine resort of San Moritz for the Archduke's skiing. He was an excellent skier, 
and the children learned to love the sport too. Then they went to Knopisht, a 12th century castle 30 miles outside Prague, which the Archduke bought from his aforementioned private savings that he had inherited from his Italian cousin. With the castle's staff of 55, it was not an onerous life, and Franz Ferdinand indulged his passion for modernizations to turn Knopisht into one of the most comfortable and well-equipped large homes in Europe. There, he also indulged his love for horticulture by designing and planting a famous rose garden where 200 varieties of roses bloomed. The garden became famous throughout Europe. Franz Ferdinand, who was usually standoffish and shy in public, eventually opened it on holidays to the public, where he liked to wander among the visitors, chatting to them about their shared interests in gardening. From Knopisht and its rose garden, this family of five went on an annual springtime cruise in the Adriatic, which ended at Easter, which they celebrated in Trieste. Then they took a train to Archstetten Castle in Austria, a beautiful home with spectacular views over the Danube River, where Franz Ferdinand had spent much of his own childhood. In July, the family went to spend a few weeks at a seaside resort in Belgium before decamping back to the Empire de Chlumitz, a pretty manor house that Franz Ferdinand had also purchased privately because he planned to bequeath it to his youngest son, Ernst. So because they were not in line to inherit anything from the monarchy, Franz Ferdinand used a lot of his private money to purchase homes that he could leave to all three of the children so that they would have an inheritance from their parents. Throughout the autumn, the family travelled again, living mostly in a series of hunting lodges. Franz Ferdinand was a very affectionate, loving father. Unlike many upper-class parents in the Edwardian era, he and Sophie saw a lot of their children, taking breakfast with them, meeting throughout the day when they were not at lessons, saying their bedtime prayers with them, and taking dinner as a family when there were no guests to entertain. In a letter to his stepmother, Franz Ferdinand wrote, You don't know how happy I am with my family, and how I can't thank God enough for all my happiness. They saw slightly less of the uh, two sons when they were sent to study at a school rather than be educated at home by tutors like most royal children. The two boys were sent to the Scotland Gymnasium, a boarding school in Vienna run by the Benedictine Order of Monks and modelled on elite private schools like Eton, Harrow and Winchester in England. There they were taught alongside um, relatively progressive members of the nobility. Boarding school was still quite rare and regarded as again a modernisation in most of the Austrian elite. Some of the nobility there included their cousin, the future Prince of Liechtenstein, but also and certainly all of the, the students at the Scotland Gymnasium were very wealthy, but the pupils were often sons of factory owners, industrialists, bankers, prom- prominent politicians and generals. And whilst to us that's simply the elite mixing with the elite, it was quite a big step for the heir to the throne to have his children up and obviously they're not in line to the succession, but still for the heir to the throne to have the children educated a in a school at all rather than at home and b to have their classmates be people from outside the hereditary aristocracy attitudes to franz ferdinand's marriage eventually began to thaw as the viennese court's pettiness generated sympathy for sophie in the press and across europe Knowing of the archduke's sympathy for the slavic people of the empire the king and queen of romania pointedly invited the couple to visit them for a long weekend at their magnificent new home at Palesh in the Carpathian Mountains. When Franz Ferdinand went to London to attend the Chelsea Flower Show, the British royal family invited the couple privately to lunch at Buckingham Palace, where they were given a tour by the king's widowed mother, Queen Alexandra. Sophie made a very good impression on Alexandra, who had been led by snobbish gossips to expect a vulgar and greedy Aravist. Queen Alexandra and her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary, were so impressed by Sophie that they pointedly invited the couple back in an official capacity the following year, during which King George and Queen Mary very tactfully did not invite any British princesses to the functions in order to avoid making Sophie feel uncomfortable over questions of etiquette or precedence. 
Queen Mary told her son, the future King George VI, that she found the couple both extremely nice and easy to get on with. The Belgian royal family joined Franz Ferdinand, Sophie and their children during their summer holidays. And the German Kaiser was so charmed by Sophie that he bowed over her hand as he kissed it in a gesture that produced stomach-churning bile in Vienna and excitement in newspapers, gossip columns. An emperor had bowed to someone the Viennese court had spent years humiliating. After nine years of their marriage, Emperor Franz Josef himself was impressed enough by Sophie to finally grant her a title. He would not budge on making her an archduchess, thus equal to her husband, but the emperor did make her Duchess of Hohenberg, and that title would be allowed to pass on to their eldest son, Max. A year later, Franz Josef took another step towards reconciliation, when he declared that Sophie could now be addressed as Your Highness, still a step below her husband's Imperial Highness, but a significant move in her favour nonetheless. As 1914 spring bloomed into a gorgeous hot summer, Franz Ferdinand was 50, tall, broad-chested, but pale. He had the large blue eyes of the Habsburgs and the prematurely thinning hair of his uncle the Emperor, which he was very self-conscious about. He had outbursts of quite a nasty bad temper, but nonetheless he was quick to apologise when in the wrong, and he always appreciated the truth, even if he did not want to hear it. In the last weekend of June 1914, the Austro-Hungarian armies were planning to hold a two-day manoeuvre of just over 20,000 soldiers in the hills around Sarajevo and Bosnia to demonstrate new tactics, and in particular, to showcase some of the modernizations that Franz Ferdinand had implemented. The provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina were the most unsettled in the empire. The Serbian population, predominantly members of the Orthodox faith, wanted the provinces to leave the empire to unite with the independent kingdom of Serbia to the south. A united Serbia was something vehemently opposed by most of Bosnia and Herzegovina's Islamic and Catholic Croat communities, both of whom felt they would be discriminated against in a greater Serbia and therefore looked to Vienna to protect them. The Serbian nationalist cause punched harder than its swing, thanks to the backing provided to them by Russia, where nationalist public opinion took a highly sympathetic view towards Little Serbia, as it was called, in her struggle for Slavic unity. In Serbia itself, populist and terrorist organisations like the Black Hand, with its shadowy initiation rituals that famously included keeping vigil all night in the presence of skulls, had dedicated themselves to expelling the Austrians from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Powerful sections of the Serbian government secretly supported the Black Hand, logistically, morally and financially. Given all this, Oskar Potiorek was thus less than thrilled to be appointed Austrian governor of Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1911. It was like being handed a poisoned chalice than having to act delighted while sipping from it. Leading an embattled administration that could do nothing without offending at least one community in the province, Governor Potiorek badly wanted some sign of royal approval that would cement his credibility. The 1914 army manoeuvres were a perfect opportunity for him to do just that by inviting a senior member of the imperial family to visit and thus shore up Potiorek's administration. His first choice was the emperor, who at 84 was very sick with bronchitis. Given his age and the illness, the emperor declined the invitation, but since Franz Ferdinand took such an interest in the armed forces and had never been to Sarajevo, he could go to represent the imperial family. Such a visit might also bolster loyalty to the throne in the region. Franz Ferdinand did not agree with his uncle's assessment of the situation. He thought the visit was a terrible idea, as did several high-ranking officials in Sarajevo, including the chief of the Sarajevo police, who urged the imperial administration to reconsider their plans. The chief of police was particularly stunned to discover that through a 
potent cocktail of short-sighted and dim-witted idiocy, the governor had arranged for the Archduke to enter Sarajevo on the feast day of St. Vitus. That was going to be, well, and he would be entering Sarajevo for the last big day of the tour on the feast day of St. Vitus, a festival dear to Serbian Orthodox Christians as the anniversary of a medieval Serbian victory long associated with the expulsion of an oppressive foreign power. Nobody in Catholic Vienna seemed to be aware of the significance of the date, but that was because Governor Potiorek, desperate for the royal visit, did not enlighten them. Shortly before he left, the Archduke went on a hunting weekend with some friends. He confided to his hostess, Princess Daisy von Pless, that he had a terrible feeling about going to Sarajevo. The Serbian nationalist press in Bosnia was already criticising the visit, and one newspaper editorial had referred to Franz Ferdinand's wife as, quote, a monstrous, filthy, bohemian whore. Bohemian here refers to her Czech birth. Despite this, Sophie was determined to accompany her husband. She did not want him to endure the visit on his own. Various precautions were taken for the couple's safety. They would not spend nights in Sarajevo. Instead, they would stay at Elizia, an upper-class holiday resort a few miles from the city. It would make them harder to reach and thus easier to protect. Despite hearing of these precautions, the Archduke's dread got worse. He was struggling to sleep, and on the day before he set off, he asked his valet, Franz Janoszek, to come to speak to him. The Archduke handed over the keys to his locked desk, then gave him instructions on what to do with the private papers if something fatal happened in Sarajevo. Franz Ferdinand's fears were right on the proverbial money. As he was handing the keys over to Janoszek, the valet, a cabinet meeting was taking place in Serbia's capital city of Belgrade, at which the Prime Minister Nikola Pazic blithely told his colleagues that he had heard that there were plans to assassinate the Archduke during the forthcoming visit to Sarajevo. Heard, helped arrange... Who are we to split hairs? The intended assassin was a 19-year-old high school dropout called Gavrilo Princip with a depressingly predictable passion for Nietzsche, which I count as an immediate red flag. Young and imp- in anyone, anyone who tells me they love Nietzsche, I think. Who hurt you? Young and impressionable, he had trained with the Black Hand Academies, and he was planning to murder Franz Ferdinand in a coordinated attack with his former flatmates, Trifko Grabej and Nedeljko Kabrinovich. Princip's youth and his undoubted love for his country have caused many writers to romanticise him as a sort of passionate young idealist driven to commit a lone and terrible act through sheer desperation. I wrote a book in um, 2014 called The Emperors, that covered um, the the First World War from the perspective of monarchies that uh, lost their thrones at the end of it. And I, if I'm honest, in that book, I was thoroughly unconvinced by any extenuating circumstances made on, or extenuating excuses, sorry, offered as um, arising from Princip's age. Uh, maybe it's because I'm, a, I'm eight years older now that I, I do think I, I I wobble on this because at the same you know he was he was nineteen he was an adult you know even today he would be old enough to vote and serve in the army so I I don't want to to say we're dealing with it we we are dealing with an adult but there is something. Uh, bone chilling or skin crawling about the fact that the three who were sent to do it were all much younger than the men who arranged it and um you know he he hadn't completed his education there there is there is a sense of I don't know, there's something about the men who organised it that I think they have sort of gotten off 
historiographically scot-free. And even people, you know, by the way, Princip has a lot of sympathizers, even those who are sort of more pro-Austrian in their take on this tend to, to funnel the criticism at Princip and leave out his backers. What I will say is, um, you know, his radicalization did not take place in occupied Bosnia, but when he emigrated to Serbia, it was in Belgrade that he gave himself over to the nationalist cause with absolute fervor. It's also incumbent on me to say he never expressed remorse for what he'd done, even when he saw that what he had done had helped unleash the First World War. Uh, and before embarking on his mission to Sarajevo, he clearly stated his confidence in how justifiable it was to use terror to achieve the dream of a united Serbia. So I don't I understand the arguments about the sense that he was all, he was molded. I think that might be going a little too far, but I, I do have I, I can see the I can see the logic behind it. But you can't see him in isolation. And it is really important to think the ways in which Gavrilo Princip's views were shared and encouraged by many of the most powerful figures in Serbia, including a man called Colonel Dragutin Dmitrojevic, who was simultaneously both the chief of the Serbian intelligence service and one of the leaders of the Black Hand. So it was Dmitrojevic who spoke to Gavrilo Princip before he went. It was Dmitrojevic who gave him four revolvers and six bombs to kill Franz Ferdinand and then gave him vials of cyanide to kill himself before he was captured. Dmitrojevic was the one who covertly arranged for Serbian customs officials to smuggle the three young men across the border without passports back into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was Dmitrojevic who spoke with military attaches at the Russian embassy in Belgrade, casually asking, in theory only, how deep Russia's commitment to Serbia would run if Serbia, for some reason, happened to get herself into difficulty with Austria. And it was Dmitrojevic who tried to smooth things over with the Black Hand Central Executive Committee when they tried belatedly to stop the attack, fearing that the Archduke's murder would bring the full fury of Austria crashing down upon Serbia. But by then it was too late. Princip was over the border and out of touch. Or out of reach, I suppose. Justifying his actions years later, Colonel Dmitrojevic claimed... Feeling that Austria was planning a war with us, I thought that the disappearance of the Austrian heir apparent would weaken the power of the military clique he headed, and thus the danger of war would be removed or postponed for a while. So we have to ask ourselves, how on earth could Dmitrijevic have gotten it so wrong? I mean, he was the head of the Serbian intelligence service. Is it credible that he could have received intelligence so wrong that it misrepresented Franz Ferdinand's views so completely? I don't think so. I think all, actually all the evidence from the Times suggests that Dmitrijevic knew, as many people knew, that Franz Ferdinand was planning to grant significant federal political concessions to Bosnia and Herzegovina once he became emperor. And those concessions would weaken support for the Serbian nationalist cause. For the more reasonable Austria was in her behaviour, the less appealing Serbia became, and the impetus for unification might fall away. So Franz Ferdinand did not die because he was a militarist reactionary, as Dmitrijevic claimed after the war. He died because of who he was as a senior member of the Austrian imperial family, and because of the inconvenient appeal of the reforms he might have implemented. Sophie, or Her Highness the Duchess of Hohenberg, arrived in Elysia by train on the 25th of June, with one of her ladies-in-waiting, Countess von Wallenberg, keeping her company. The military theme of the visit kicked off as the Archduke cruised to join them on the Viribus Unitas, one of the new battleships in the Imperial Navy. Brought ashore, Franz Ferdinand 
tactfully and purposefully addressed one of the welcome committees in Croatia. Large crowds of Muslims and Catholics had gathered to cheer Franz Ferdinand, which he said left him deeply moved. When he arrived at their suite in Elysia, he telegraphed his daughter to tell her of how much they were enjoying the visit and how beautiful the summer weather was proving to be. The first few days of the royal visit continued in a similarly upbeat way. Sophie and Franz Ferdinand asked to pay a private visit to a local merchant called Elias Cabaligio, who had decorated their rooms at the hotel. They wanted to thank him personally. After that, they publicly visited the city bazaar, where they were again cheered by Catholic and Muslim supporters. Also in that crowd, weaving his way towards them, was Gavrilo Princip. He later claimed that he did not shoot them there and then, because it was never his intention to kill Sophie too. And that day at the bazaar, she was always standing too close to her husband. I should point out that one of his fellow conspirators, Nedeljko Kabrinovich, contradicted Princip in his testimony when he said this was not true. As Kabrinovich pointed out, they had been given bombs by Dmitrijevich because the plan was, if they couldn't get the Archduke on his own, they had all agreed that we would sacrifice her and all the others to make sure they killed Franz Ferdinand. Whatever the reason, Princip didn't fire, and the imperial couple went back to Elysia unaware of how close they had come to death. At the weekend, the Archduke went off into the hills to watch the army manoeuvres, while Sophie went back into Sarajevo, where she visited the city's churches, mosques, orphanages and schools. She reunited with a Catholic priest called Father Anton Puntigam. He had once been Franz Ferdinand's private confessor before he had left imperial service to work at a convent school in Sarajevo. Sophie went to the school where she met some of the students and teachers. That evening, back at Elidia, she telephoned her eldest son, Max, to wish him good luck in his summer exams, the last of which he was due to take at school in Vienna the next day. A dejected Gabrilo Princip, meanwhile, left his colleagues drinking in a local tavern. He wandered through the city streets, bought a wreath, and made a political solo pilgrimage to the grave of Bogdan Zarajak, a member of the Black Hand who had shot himself four years earlier when his plan to murder the governor had failed. Princip laid his wreath on the grave and reflected that both of them might be failures for tomorrow would be the last chance he had to succeed in killing the future emperor of the land that stood in the way of a united Serbia. Meanwhile, at Elizia, Franz Ferdinand and Sophie had moved on to hosting a 43-person dinner party for local dignitaries. The conversation initially centred on the Kaiser's recent visit to see the Rose Garden at Klonopisht. Then it turned to mutual congratulations on how well the trip to Sarajevo had gone thus far. A servant arrived with a telegram from Vienna. Their son Max had passed his exams, which inspired a toast and a round of applause. After pudding, a few members of the Archduke's entourage raised the issue of St Vitus's Day. Since arriving, someone had belatedly tipped them off to the day's significance. St Vitus's Day was the next day, the 28th. So, some suggested it was senseless to tempt fate. Everything had gone well. They should cancel the next day's itinerary and go back to Austria a day earlier than planned. The Archduke was about to agree until Governor Pociorek was sitting at the table, who was sitting at the table, raised so many anguished objections about how people and organisations would be disappointed, how much planning had gone into your royal visit, they couldn't cancel at such short notice, it would upset everyone involved. Eventually, Franz Ferdinand agreed to carry on with the next day's schedule as planned. St Vitus' day dawned bright and beautiful. It was the 14th anniversary of Franz Ferdinand's oath at the Hofburg Palace that had made it possible for him to marry Sophie, and so the couple spent the morning in prayer, giving thanks for the life they had led together in the 14 years since. After prayers, they boarded the train for the short journey back to Sarajevo. They were greeted at the city station by a civic committee, then escorted to the local barracks for a brief inspection of the garrison. 
The Archduke was wearing the uniform of an Austrian cavalry general, which was a blue tunic with red pipes and gold epaulets, set off with a helmet adorned with peacock feathers. Kind of love the idea of a peacock feather in my hat. Anyway, Sophie wore a white silk dress with a rosebud corsage, a wrap, a large white hat with a veil, and matching parasol. As their motor car made its way towards an official reception at the town hall, Nedeljko Kabrinovich picked up one of his bombs and hurled it at the passing motorcade. The Archduke's chauffeur, a man called Leopold Leuka, noticed the unusual activity out of the corner of his eye and slammed his foot on the accelerator. Thanks to Leuka, the bomb missed the car by a few feet and bounced into the buildings on the other side of the street. Twenty people were injured in the blast, no fatalities. A tiny piece of shrapnel hit the Duchess in the back of the neck. Kabrinovich lost the chance to swallow his cyanide capsule by taking time to shout about himself, I am a Serbian hero. By the time he had finished writing what he thought would be his own eulogy, members of the enraged and frightened crowd had swarmed forward trying to lynch him. He was rescued by the police who prevented him swallowing the capsule and arrested him. Watching from a distance, Gavrilo Princip aimed to shoot his captured friend to stop him implicating the Serbian government under questioning. However, as with the incident at the bazaar a few days ago, Princip could not get the shot. Kabrinovich was dragged away in police custody. Accepting that their plan had now failed, Princip wandered aimlessly to a nearby cafe where he sat down dejected and almost heartbroken. The Archduke arrived at the town hall and interrupted the mayor's welcome speech by screaming, What kind of greeting is this? I come to Sarajevo and I am greeted with bombs. It is outrageous. Sophie stepped forward and spoke gently to her husband under her breath. The heir took a deep breath and apologised to the mayor for his outburst. He allowed the official speeches to resume, and in his reply he even referred to this magnificent region, which has Sarajevo as its beautiful capital city. The Duchess went upstairs to host a ladies-only reception for the wives of local Islamic politicians who could unveil themselves in her presence. The Archduke hosted the men downstairs. But when he spotted Governor Potiorek, his rage returned. He mocked the governor in front of the crowd, or the so, revellers, um, guests at the reception, for organising a visit that had resulted in a bomb attack, especially after the advice he had negated the previous evening. Would there be other assassins lurking in the streets? Had the bomb been a warm-up act? Possibly. That, after all, was how Tsar Alexander II of Russia had been killed in 1881. To evade other potential attacks, the imperial entourage decided that after the receptions and the civic lunch, the motorcade would deviate from the pre-planned route through the city. Franz Ferdinand tried to persuade Sophie to travel back to the train station privately without him. No, Franzi, she said, I am going with you. In the car, Count Franz von Harrach, a 43-year-old member of the Archduke's entourage, placed himself in front of the couple, intending to use himself as a human shield if they were attacked again. The car moved through streets that were still tense from Kabrinovich's earlier bomb, and it was only at this point that Governor Potiorek realised that their chauffeur was not taking the new route. In all their plans, they had all forgotten to tell the driver of the change. The governor leaned forward to tell Loika that he was now driving the wrong way. Heeding the governor's instructions, Loika stopped, pulled the handbrake, and prepared to turn the car in the new route. The car was braking and then turning slowly next to the cafe where Gavrilo Princip had gone to lick his wounds. Princip emerged from the cafe to find himself standing three yards from the Habsburg air. On instinct, he pulled out his gun and began firing. Sophie turned to see if her husband had been hit. Both she and Count von Harrach saw the same thing. A trickle of blood spilling from Franz Ferdinand's mouth. The Duchess screamed and collapsed. 
while members of the crowd and the imperial retinue hurled themselves at Princip, likewise preventing him from swallowing his cyanide as planned. In the car, Franz Ferdinand still hadn't realised how badly he had been wounded. He cradled a collapsed Sophie, begging her to stay alive for their children's sake. Princip's bullet had hit just above the Archduke's collarbone. Count von Harak began screaming instructions at Loika the driver, who moved with truly impressive speed and precision. Trying to keep the Archduke upright, Count von Harak went over to sit next to him and pressed a handkerchief on the wound. As panic swept the streets around them, Count von Harak shouted, Is your Imperial Highness in great pain? The Archduke shook his head and kept trying to hold his wife. It is nothing, he replied to von Harak. He kept repeating, it is nothing, until he lost consciousness. When they reached the governor's residence, the servants and welcoming committee were instead confronted by scenes of bloodshed. Doctors and priests were summoned as Franz Ferdinand and the unconscious Duchess were lifted from the car and carried into the mansion. Sophie was taken into Governor Potiorek's private rooms where her lady-in-waiting laid her out on the bed, waiting for the arrival of a surgeon who would check her for any wounds and revive her. The Archduke was taken to the Governor's study where they set him down on a chaise long. Franz Ferdinand's aide-de-camp, Baron Andreas von Morsi, grabbed a knife and cut the Archduke out of his military tunic to see precisely where he had been wounded. Blood was by this point gurgling out from the Archduke's mouth, spraying the clothes, hands and faces of the men struggling to save his life. Baron von Morsi was clutching Franz Ferdinand in his arms and still desperately trying to get him to speak when one of the doctors said quietly, His Imperial Highness's suffering is over. Some of the men in the study burst into tears. Many crossed themselves, and the Baron reached into his pocket and took out a small crucifix and some rosary beads. He wrapped them in Franz Ferdinand's hands. Then, from the other room, a terrible scream rang out and jolted even those men weeping in shock. The screaming came from Countess von Wallenberg, Sophie's lady-in-waiting, who had been undressing her mistress before the doctors examined her. Sophie had been shot in her inferior vena cava. She had died in the car. Father Puntigam, the confessor who only a few days earlier had shown the Duchess around his new school, arrived to pray over the bodies. Countess von Wallenberg said that she felt a grief that went right down to the deepest marrow of my soul. As Father Puntagam and the Catholic members of the entourage prayed, the entire empire's telephone and telegraph lines were swiftly shut down. This was to ensure the news reached the relatives first rather than the newspapers. Sophie's younger sister, Henrietta, had to tell the couple's children after dinner. When she broke the news that they were orphans, the youngest of Franz Ferdinand and Sophie's children, 10-year-old Ernst, reportedly flew into the grips of a grief so severe that he behaved like a madman, sobbing so hard they feared he had injured himself. The eldest, 12-year-old Sophie, issued a statement requesting prayers for her departed parents and thanking everyone for their condolences. One of the kindest telegrams they received was from Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II, who, referring to his visit to their father's rose garden a few weeks before, wrote, We can hardly find words to tell you, children, how our hearts bleed, thinking of you and your indescribable misery. Only two weeks ago we spent such lovely hours with your parents, and now we hear of this terrible grief that you must suffer. May God protect you and give you the strength to bear this blow. The blessing of your parents reaches beyond death. Emperor Franz Josef, still recuperating from bronchitis, was staying at his summer villa near Salzburg. 
accounts of how he took the news vary, but perhaps the most reliable account comes from the diary of the emperor's youngest daughter, the Archduchess Maria Valerie. She knew that relations between the men had been strained, first by Franz Ferdinand's marriage and then by his politics, and she was honest enough to admit that her father was unlikely to be personally devastated by the death of a nephew he had come to distrust. However, she said that her father, the emperor, had tears in his eyes when he spoke of the sorrow that must be afflicting the three children. Just before the telegraph systems were reopened for public use, the news was also sent to Franz Ferdinand's nephew, the Archduke Karl, likewise on holiday. Taking advantage of the gorgeous weather, the 26-year-old Archduke and his Italian wife Zita had decided to lunch in the grounds of their villa when a servant arrived with a telegram addressed to Karl. Glancing at the envelope, Karl was surprised to see that it was from one of Franz Ferdinand's advisors. That's odd, Karl said to his wife. Why him? The telegram read, Deeply regret to report that His Imperial Highness and the Duchess were both assassinated here today. On the opposite side of the table, Zita noticed, Though it was a beautiful day, I saw my husband's face go white in the sun. We hurried back into the house. The first thing was to get confirmation, and in those days there was no radio or television to switch on. The only sure source would be the Emperor himself. My husband got through on the telephone and spoke to one of the palace staff on duty there. The dreadful news was true, and the Emperor was returning at once by train to Vienna. My husband was to meet him there at Heitzing, which was the nearest station to the Schönbrunn Palace. The short drive they took together in an open carriage that afternoon from the station to the palace, where I was already waiting, was the first time my husband had appeared in public as heir to the throne. The crowd, he told me, lined the pavements in stunned silence. In Sarajevo, there was hideous violence on the streets as the assassination tripped the wire of ethnic hostilities. Catholics and Muslims vented their fury and hatred on the local Serbian community. Things got worse upon press reports that there had actually been public celebrations of the deaths in Serbia. In Vienna, the mood turned firmly towards vengeance. Nobody believed that the Serbian government was not somehow complicit in the assassination. The pro-war lobby, whom Franz Ferdinand had opposed in life, now insisted with no trace of irony nor shame that his death demanded retaliatory action against Serbia. An Austrian aristocrat who had dreamed of serving Franz Ferdinand's reforms once he became emperor wrote, of tears in my eyes, tears of sorrow, of terrible rage and fury. Oh, the misery of it. He, our future, our leader, who was to be the strong man, he to whom we all looked to in the future, as our saviour out of all the long past years of ineptitude. How can one bear such felony? And must not every civilised creature on earth stand up and pray for damnation and God's fire of vengeance on that vile, murderous country, Serbia? That was very much the general mood in Austria by the start of July 1914. Count von Harrach, the courtier who had planned to shield the couple from harm, was haunted by the events of Sarajevo for the rest of his life. I stood on the wrong side, he said years later. If I had stood on the right side of them instead of the left, I would have taken the bullets and I could have saved their lives. An arrested Garrillo Princip was sentenced to years of hard labour as the Habsburgs received condolences from every government in Europe with the exceptions of Serbia and Montenegro. The Romanian government ordered official mourning for a month, while unusually the Vatican commented specifically on the issue as Pope Pius X spoke publicly of my sharp pain for the loss of such a wise and enlightened prince and my deep anger against the perpetrators of such a despicable attack. A few weeks later, the Tsar of Russia, ruler over a country where the public still overwhelmingly backed Serbia, hosted the President and Prime Minister of France for a state visit. 
Germany had promised to back her Austrian ally in whatever actions she felt justified taking against Serbia in retaliation for the assassination. The Tsar felt that German militarists were hoping to exploit the tragedy to pursue their own ends, but he assured the French ambassador it would all come to nothing, because the Kaiser and his government always spoke louder than they acted. If you knew him as I do, the Tsar said wearily, if you knew how much theatricality there is in Wilhelm's posing. Despite this, the president was invited to attend a military review of 60,000 Russian soldiers, where he was joined in the stands by the Tsarina and her two eldest daughters. A banquet was held for the French visitors at the Peterhof Palace. Balls and dinner parties followed, all of it a clear indicator to the world that the alliance between Russia and France remained intact, whatever happened next. At one of the parties in Russia, The French ambassador sat next to the Grand Duchess Melitza, a Montenegrin princess by birth and strongly pro-Serbia. There's going to be a war, she predicted to the ambassador. There'll be nothing left of Austria, she added gleefully. Our armies will meet in Berlin. Germany will have been destroyed. Then, looking up, Melitza noticed that the Tsar had overheard her and seemed angry at what she was saying. I must restrain myself, she whispered. The emperor has his eyes on me. What had happened to turn two murders into a cause for war? Even if there was going to be a war over the Archduke and the Duchess's killing, why wasn't it confined to one between Austria and Serbia? Well, within 24 hours of the murders, the Austrian government had accused the Serbian government of complicity. Six days later, Germany made the promise to support her ally in Austria in whatever action she felt compelled to take. This offer, however seriously it was intended, and historians do debate that, meant two things. The first was that the Tsar was correct. Those in Germany who wanted a war were hoping that the dispute over Franz Ferdinand's death would give them the opportunity they had been waiting for. The second impact of that offer of unconditional German support was that Austria could no longer back down without losing face. Those within Franz Josef's government who wanted a war against Serbia, chiefly Franz Ferdinand's former friend, Chief of Staff von Hotzendorf, believed that with German support, Austria could proceed with confidence against Serbia and permanently crush the threat that lay on the empire's southern borders. The Austrian Prime Minister, Count von Stöger, argued that if they did not act, the empire was finished in all but name. After all, what country worthy of the name, he said, could stand by and allow such an attack on her honour to go unpunished? The knowledge that the empire would not be acting alone but with support from Germany smoothed lingering Hungarian concerns and so both halves of the empire acted in unity, issuing an ultimatum to Serbia. It was delivered on the 23rd of July, three and a half weeks after the assassination, by which point Austro-Hungarian troops had already been moved to the frontier with Serbia. What were the ultimatum's terms? Firstly, the demand was that Serbia must condemn and suppress all propaganda, societies and publications that had ever called for terrorist attacks on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Vienna would supply a list at a later date which contained the names of any high-profile Serbian individuals they suspected of having engaged in activities harmful to the Austro-Hungarian monarchies. Once that list was received, the Serbian government must permanently dismiss these people from public service. Serbia must bring to trial all those who had been involved in plotting Franz Ferdinand's assassination, including the customs officials who had let Princip and his fellow conspirators cross the border. Mm -hmm. Austrian and Hungarian representatives must be allowed to come into Serbia to oversee all of these arrests, trials, and the suppression of the Black Hand Committees, training academies, and cells. And it was that last clause, the one about allowing Austrian oversight of internal Serbian procedures, which proved the most controversial, for the Serbian government believed, or claimed to believe, that this was only a front to mask a forthcoming Austrian invasion. 
and even those previously sympathetic to Austria-Hungary after the murder felt that the ultimatum was going too far. Winston Churchill, then serving as Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty, thought the ultimatum of July 1914 was a bullying and humiliating ultimatum to Serbia who cannot possibly comply with it. It struck many as a piece of wanton belligerence, particularly in light of the unsavoury impression created by so many of Franz Ferdinand's former opponents using his death as an excuse to pursue a policy he had always regarded as dangerous. And these short-term factors all began to bleed and filter into long-term nationalist, military, economic and political tensions between what was then called the Great Powers. Russia, for instance, felt honour-bound to protect Serbia. Nationalists in Russia still resented Nicholas II for having allowed the solidification of Austrian control over Herzegovina and Bosnia six years earlier. Was he going to fail to act, as Austria did the same to Serbia, a fellow Slavic nation? Talk in St. Petersburg turned increasingly towards mobilisation of the army. Some in the Russian government hoped that full or partial mobilisation might persuade Germany and Austria-Hungary to moderate their demands. In Berlin, the mood was in, or at least going, in the opposite direction. When a rumour circulated that Serbia had finally agreed to all of Austria's terms, there was disappointment in Berlin. The German foreign minister was reportedly in despair, now they had lost the chance to go to war. And so when news leaked through confirming that Serbia had in fact rejected the condition to allow Austrian officials to cross into Serbia, several German ministers and generals cheered. With Serbia rejecting what was characterised as the most important clause in the ultimatum, Austria-Hungary declared war on the 20th of July, a month to the day since the assassinations. The Austrian declaration of war infuriated the Tsar to do nothing as Serbia was crushed, as she undoubtedly would be, by the superior might of the Habsburgs' armies would rile public opinion in Russia and weaken Russia's international standing. The Tsar fired off a telegram to his wife's cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm, in which he said, An ignoble war has been declared on a weak country. The indignation in Russia, fully shared by me, is enormous. I see very soon I shall be overwhelmed by the pressure brought upon me and be forced to take extreme measures which will lead to war. The Kaiser actually hoped there would not be a war. He was one of the very few in the German elite who hoped there wouldn't, and he too felt swept along by the tidal wave of militarist fervour. Wilhelm was like Knut trying to turn back the unstoppable. With Russia mobilising to defend Serbia against Austria, Germany decided to do the same to honour her promises to Austria. This was Imperial Germany's chance, ostensibly to support her Austrian allies, but in reality to deal with her long-term worries about the two countries that surrounded her to east and west, Russia and France. Confident that Britain would fall back on her usual position of quote-unquote splendid isolation, the militarist theory in Germany went that if a war was to come in Europe and given how many tensions there had been over the past few decades that seemed a fair prediction, then it had better come before the Russian Empire had a chance to complete her industrialization. Germany had more men in the armed forces than France and more equipment than Russia. Striking at them both now would dent their progress for another generation thus ensuring that Germany was not threatened by her eastern or western neighbours. This plan had support from the Kaiser's wife, the Empress, their eldest son, the Crown Prince, Admiral von Tirpitz, and all of the military high command. Even liberal German politicians, like the famous financier Walter Rathenau, believed that the timing was in Germany's favour. War was going to come one way or the other. 1914 was the point at which it was in Germany's favour to do so. They had long been prepared for this with a secret military dossier called the Schlieffenplan. France and Russia's alliance was long-standing. Germany did not want to deal with both of them at the same time. That would be the nightmare of a war on two fronts. The plan was thus to march 
the German army quickly, through Belgium, outmaneuvering French defences on the border, take Paris, forcing a capitulation through rapid warfare in six weeks. With France knocked out of the war, the full might of the German army and navy could be swung eastward to take care of Russia. Guessing where this might be going, the British government then told Germany that although Britain hoped to remain neutral in any coming war, she could not do so if Germany violated any previous peace treaties guaranteeing the neutrality of countries, specifically Belgium, which Britain had vowed to protect under the terms of the Treaty of London. Given that the Treaty of London had been signed 75 years earlier, there were many in the German cabinet who thought the British were bluffing. The British had long distrusted the growth in German power, and particularly in the German Navy. They were doing this to intimidate Germany, but they would not possibly consider going to war over a country in which they had no territorial interest. Armed with this extremely ill-informed confidence. On the 1st of August, Germany declared war on Russia, citing their recent mobilisation as justification. They asked the Belgian government for permission to cross through their territory to France. The young king of the Belgians, Albert I, refused, but on the 3rd of August, the Germans declared war on France by invading Belgium. King Albert assumed personal command of his armies, and although Belgium stood no chance of victory in the long term, their resistance managed to slow German progress far more than they had ever anticipated. Within days of the war beginning, the Schlieffen plan that had promised such a quick victory had already failed. The British, it turned out, had every intention of honouring the Treaty of London, and so by September... The French and British armies had arrived in Belgium and the north of France, digging themselves into trenches to halt and then face their German opponents. And that was how the Western Front, the theatre of the war in which millions of lives were either lost or decimated, began. South in Austria, the new heir to the throne, Archduke Karl, left for the front on the 16th of August, the day after the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a day of holy obligation in the Catholic calendar. Karl's wife Zita and their two children were invited to move into the Schönbrunn Palace to live under the Emperor's protection while Karl was at the front. Every afternoon, the Emperor would call to Zita's apartments to take tea and spend time visiting her and the children. A third child, the Archduke Robert, was born in 1915. During these tea-time visits, Franz Josef talked to Zita like a man gazing back on his life with regret and the future with horror. He told her how in his heart he had never recovered from 1848, the year his uncle Ferdinand abdicated in his favour when he'd been given the throne aged 18 to save it from the threat of rebellion. All of his work, that dogged, compulsive, mind-numbing, bureaucratic toil that he carried out to a strict schedule day in, day out for over 60 years, it had all been Franz Josef's attempt to impose order on chaos and then keep chaos at bay. Yet if his days were spent working at the business of monarchy, his nights were haunted by the fear that nothing had really changed since 1848. That, as he told Zita, my empire is like a volcano which is uneasily sleeping. He told her how he believed that nationalism was the plague of the century, how he had done everything to halt its progress. Not only, and this is according to Zita, because he saw the empire threatened by nationalist movements, because its future depended on alliances with all their uncertainties and weaknesses. Watching Franz Josef at close quarters, Zita believed he was horrified by the war that had been unleashed by his nephew's murder. It was only years and years later, when she herself was elderly, that Zita could appreciate that Franz Josef had been right in believing that a war that had been intended as one of revenge for a murder had in fact rapidly become one driven by the worst excesses of his own self-declared enemy, nationalism. 
As a young woman, however, Archduchess Zita, like many Austrians, continued to believe that Austria and her allies, Germany, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire, would win because their cause was just. They were going to war to punish a murder. The other side were going to war to protect murderers. That was how she saw it. One afternoon, Zita was in a fantastic mood after hearing news of a military victory on the Eastern Front where her husband was stationed. When the Emperor arrived for tea, as usual, she curtsied and beamed as she rose to congratulate him. The Emperor responded by sighing, Yes, it is a victory, but that is the way all my wars always begin, only to end in defeat, and this time it will be even worse. They will say that I am old, that I cannot cope any more, and that after that, revolutions will break out, and then it will be the end. Zita was taken aback by this unpatriotic response, and although she was too polite to show it, she was offended by the Emperor's suggestion that Austria might actually lose the war. But that's surely not possible, sire, she answered. The war we are fighting is a just one. Franz Josef apparently turned to look at Zita, tilted his head to one side, and said after a long pause, Yes, one can see that you are very young, that you still believe in the victory of the just. Four years later, the Austro-Hungarian Empire lost the war, the monarchy collapsed, the empire imploded. To find out, by the way, how Zita escaped that revolution with her life, check out our season two episode, How the Windsors Saved the Habsburgs. I think it's the penultimate episode in season two. The monarchies collapsed too in Germany and Russia. Millions were dead. Hideous new military technologies had been invented and inflicted. The diplomatic thrombosis of a generation had been unleashed into full war by the death of a prince who had always hoped a war would never come. Gavrilo Princip did not live long enough to see the monarchy he loathed vanish. Seven months before the Habsburg Empire fell, 23-year-old Princip died of tuberculosis in an imperial prison. His right arm, the one which had held the gun, had been amputated after it became infected in the terrible hard labour conditions he faced. He had attempted suicide, he had failed, he died clearly malnourished. In 1920, Serbia, now uniting into a new pan-Slavic greater Serbia called Yugoslavia, found out where Princip had been buried in that prison, paid for the exhumation of his bones, and brought them back to Sarajevo where they were ceremonially reburied in a hero's chapel along with 11 others who had fought for the Black Hand and Serbian unity. It was a deliberate number, 12, the same number as the Holy Apostles of Christ. After the fall of the empire, the new government of an independent Czechoslovakia seized Konopish and evicted Franz Ferdinand's children, even though he had bought the castle privately with money inherited from an Italian cousin. With nowhere left to live in Czechoslovakia, the siblings moved to Austria, where the eldest, Sophie, married an aristocrat with whom she had four children. One of Princip's colleagues, Nedeljko Kabrinovich, the man who'd thrown the first bomb, the one that missed that day in 1914, begged for permission to apologise to the children for what had been done to their parents. Sophie wrote to Kabrinovich, telling him that she forgave him and that his soul could be at peace. Her eldest brother, Max, signed that letter as well with her. The younger, Ernst, refused to do so. They gave their letter to Father Anton Puntigam, the priest who had prayed over their parents' bodies, and he delivered it to a sincerely moved Kabrinovich in prison. In 1938, Austria was annexed by Nazi Germany and the siblings lost even more. The Nazis seized all of the siblings' remaining properties in Austria in retaliation for their anti-Nazi statements, Sophie's two brothers, Max and Ernst, were arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Dachau concentration camp. After the war, the Austrian government restored their seized properties to them, and Max, who remained active in monarchist politics in Austria, was elected mayor of his local town. Max, the Duke of Hohenberg, died in 1962, survived by his wife and their six sons and their daughter, Katharina. Ernst, the younger brother, did not recover his health from his time in the Nazi concentration camps, and he died six years later, aged only 49, 
Sophie was the last of Sophie and Franz Ferdinand's children to pass away, aged 89, in Tannhausen, Austria, in 1990. The many ifs, or maybe it's simply the whens of the 28th of June, 1914, leave that day one of the most fascinating what-ifs or if-onlys in history. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was interesting. I, I find the, all the moving parts and what could have um, could have happened differently fascinating. If you like the show and are listening on our new YouTube channel, don't forget to help that pesky algorithm, which I only vaguely understand, by liking and subscribing. If you're doing the same on Apple, Google and Spotify, like, subscribe, and if you've time and enjoyed it, leave a review. With that or without that, tune in next week when I'll be joined by Tim Ashby to discuss the improbable world of Elizabethan spies. Until then, thank you and take care.